Hi class, welcome to the first module of our literature course. At this point, you may have some questions about how to make sure you're getting what you read, and this video is all about that. So I know you've learned how to skim and scan what you read to see how long each selection is and see what each one is talking about. And I know that you've learned how to ask your own in the chapter questions that guide you as you read, and then you know the rest of the SQ3R as well, right? You've skimmed or scanned, you've asked some questions, you read to answer the questions, you recite what you've learned, you review your notes. But you're probably asking, how does all of that apply to literature? And how can you make sure that you're getting the main idea out of each one of the readings? Well, I'm here to tell you, forget all about all that getting the main idea stuff when it comes to literature. When it comes to poems, plays, stories, and just any type of creative writing, there's not just one meaning that you're supposed to get out of it. As a creative writer myself, I can tell you that we're artists and what we want you to do is to be creative alongside us. We want you to imagine and interpret and add on to the things that we put on the page. So think about the multiple meanings that you can find and also think about how there can be more than one at the same time. Sometimes there's hidden meanings that authors will just hint at because they don't want to get in any political trouble or personal trouble or financial trouble. So look out for those, look for patterns in what you read and take good notes on what you're seeing instead of just trying to figure out what everybody else thinks because everybody else isn't necessarily right. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that some interpretations don't make more sense than others, right? A reasonable interpretation is one that considers several things. So one, it'll consider the historical and social context of the work. It'll also consider the original author's tastes and likely intentions. It'll consider, of course, the actual words and ideas and events that are on the page. So to start with historical and social context, it would not make much sense or be very reasonable to say that an ancient text like Homer's Odyssey was written to critique social media. The internet didn't even exist. But it might be responsible to say that the Odyssey, an ancient text, shows us the devastating effects of war on soldiers and their families. Because war existed, families existed. But that's only if you can point out several parts of the book where soldiers and their families are actually devastated. So that's why you need to keep really good notes on the reading, including page numbers for any proof that you find. And in this case, that would be page numbers where, hey, here's a devastated soldier, here's a family that seems harmed or upset by the war. That's what's gonna help you be able to be confident and convincing with your interpretation. But like I said before, the historical context and what's on the page are only part of it. You might need more to really understand what you're reading, especially as you study literature from around the globe. So to really get what you're reading, you might need to get the culture behind the work, which might need, mean you do some research. Now, thank goodness you got Google or DuckDuckGo or Bing or whatever search engine you prefer to use on your side. All you have to know is where and when a work was created and you can just search the values and the ideals of that culture. And that can let you know why certain characters might behave the way they behave or why the authors might be praising certain things that you don't think are all that good. Now, if you have a scholarly resource like a literature anthology, hey, hey, literature anthology, or a university website, usually ends in .edu, you can also access a wealth of background information and context really, really quick. For example, literature anthologies usually start each selection with biographical information about the author and his or her culture and times. Like so, 
Matsuoba show and you see when he was born and died. Now that usually comes before the title of the work. You can read the biographical information before you start reading the actual work. You can read it after. It's really up to you. No, just know that knowing more about the person who created the work or about the culture that created the person can really help you understand some things that maybe aren't clear, especially if they come from a different time and place than you. Now, if your class isn't using an anthology, of course, you know what you can do. Just Google the author, read up about them, just use a trustworthy website. Now, another thing that's in a textbook that can really help you get context and dig deeper is footnotes. So, these are little numbered tidbits that give more information about certain parts of the text. A lot of students skip these, but I highly, highly, highly recommend that you check them out. Textbook editors are adding these because they know that you don't know about that culture or that time period or why they named that mountain and where that mountain is. For example, let's say if you weren't from America and you were reading something that talks about certain well-known dates in American culture, like 1776 or September 11th or January 6th. If you're not from this country and you haven't learned that history, then you're not gonna know what the 4th of July is all about or why it's a big deal. So the textbook authors would add a footnote. The same thing goes for you now, reading about something that was written in 1776, about something even older than that. You'll notice that the textbook puts the footnotes where there's a little number that matches up to the same little number at the bottom of the page. That's why it's called a footnote, because it's at the foot of the page. So that's more about how to get context. The last thing I want to point out, though, goes back to the words that are on the page. Keep in mind that most pieces of writing go through some kind of translation. In a world literature class, most of the works have been written in some language that you might not know, Sometimes a language that nobody knows anymore, like Latin or hieroglyphs or runes. So someone obviously has translated these works into English. And even if the works were originally written in English, they may have been typed or transcribed from someone's handwritten diary or journal. They might have been pieced together from falling apart fragments that someone found. So then you need to think, why does this matter? Literature isn't just main ideas, like I said before. Literature is about making music and art with language. That includes beautiful images or wonderful rhythms or both. And what's beautiful in one culture or in one language might just be downright ugly or strange in another one. And that's not even to mention how some things just don't translate. Like how in English we have words like sushi or schadenfreude or que sera sera because some things just don't translate. So as you're reading, keep that in mind. A lot of the things you've written have been shaped and formed by multiple different hands before they got into this book or even onto a website. If you can, try and check out texts in their original forms and in their original languages, and then compare the two. Whether or not you know the original language doesn't have to be a big deal. I don't suggest that you try to use Google Translate or something like that. If you know a Romance language like Spanish, French, or Portuguese, or Italian, a lot of the words and a lot of the way the language is structured is similar enough that you can kind of figure things out. English has a lot of similar vocabulary as German. You can sound out Hebrew and Arabic, they're kind of similar. So you don't have to learn a new language. You can just try and sound it out and see the similarities. Especially because so many languages 
you know, as we get more global in the world, share words and languages loan to each other. So just try and get some sense of the art of what you read. The rhythm, the harmonies, the imagery. And think about how the original author worded what they said, but also how the translator or the compiler, the editor, worded it too. You might look at the original and the translation or the original and the new version and see which one you like better because there can be big differences between the two. Now, most anthologies and good websites will list the translators for any work that's not written in English, so it should be pretty easy to do. Last thing is I highly suggest that you check out this short video. I'll link to it up here. It shows you how several dead languages probably sound. It's really cool. It's called The Sound of Ancient Languages. I just suggest this because authors from all time periods refer to a lot of ancient texts that were written in hieroglyphs from ancient Egypt or runes from Ireland or Germany or someplace like that. So they're referring to it. It's good to know a little bit about how it might sound. And that was a lot of information. I'm going to try to keep these mini lectures as short as I can. So just to recap really quickly, one, don't look for one meaning. Look for multiple interpretations and take notes on the evidence reach. Two, read up on the author and his or her context. Use author bios, use footnotes, and use the good old internet. And three, pay attention to how the authors and translators word things and compare the originals to the translations or the new versions. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments and happy reading.